Hello, welcome to the Governance Podcast at the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society at King's College London. My name is John Medicroft, I'm a reader in public policy here at King's, and I'm delighted to be joined by David Scarbeck. David was a member of the Department of Political Economy here at King's. He's presently an Associate Professor at Brown University in the Political Science Department, and spending the year at Berkeley visiting their Centre for the Study of Law and Society. Well, it's great to have you here at King's, David. Um, you're well known for writing a book on prison gangs in California and America called The Social Order of the Underworld. Maybe just to begin, why don't you tell us a little bit about The Social Order of the Underworld? Oh, thanks, John. I'm delighted to be back. Um, prisons in California today are ruled or governed by very hierarchically um, uh, organized groups. They're ethnically and racially segregated organizations. These prison gangs have a dominant influence on the everyday life of prisoners in California. And that means that when people um, go out to the prison yard, where they can sit, who they can associate with, uh, which basketball courts they can use, all of that is decided through a sometimes violent, but not, not always violent, set of negotiations between these prison gangs. So gangs govern social interactions amongst prisoners, and they also play a very important role in governing uh, economic interactions between prisoners. So there's a, a significant underground economy amongst prisoners, and gangs play a sort of governmental role in regulating um, how those transactions take place and often adjudicating problems that arise in the underground economy. Thanks. Well, you mentioned there that prison gangs are often organized on racial lines. I mean, why is that the case? I mean, are these people racists? So it's definitely clear that many prison gang members are racist, and they often use a lot of racist uh, icons and um, um, sort of motifs. But um, what's interesting about gangs is that they also interact across racial lines. When you talk to prisoners who abide by racially segregated informal rules in prison, they say, I'm not a racist, but this environment is dominated by racial rules and I have to comply with them. And so it seems the case that even though these groups are broken down by racial lines, a lot of the reasons why that's the case has to do with non-hateful sort of hateful, racist ideologies. And so my basic argument is that gangs emerge in large populations of prisoners, in large populations of strangers. And these gangs operate in um, sort of a mutual responsibility system. So if, and if a member of a particular group violates some social or economic rule, other prisoners can go to his shop caller, his gang leader, and ask that they hold their own member accountable. So these gangs are organized in such a way to exert tremendous in-group pressure to facilitate social and economic interactions across groups. Now, how does this come to the race issue? Well, these gangs, they dominate in large prison populations where you may not, cannot, you know, not know who most other prisoners are. And so by affiliating along racial and ethnic lines, it becomes far easier for strangers who've been subject to some social insult or some economic opportunism. It's far easier for a stranger to know who to go to turn to, to complain, to hold some particular prisoner uh, responsible. So that's why in the large prison populations today, race is so important. And in prior to the 1960s, the small prison populations, race was far less important in defining social relationships. So, so race is, if you like, is it a, a convenient way of organizing a large number of people? Is that, is that the argument in a sense? That's right. In large populations, if you want to hold strangers accountable, you have to know who to go to to hold them accountable. And race is a very low-cost way to sort of look at someone and know pretty well who you need to go to speak with. Yeah, okay. So does that mean that this has changed over time? So as, pris as a prison population has got bigger in America, then gangs and gangs organized upon racial lines have become more important. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I found fascinating in doing the research for this book, is that gangs have this dominant influence in prison life today, but prisons existed in California for more than 100 years, and there are no groups like these. So if they were so important today, how could they 
not even exist before. And so I wanted to understand why is it that there is this radical transformation in the social order in California prisons. And as you note, I think it's very much tied to the size of the prison population. These gangs are very effective at providing governance, but it takes a lot of resources. They have to invest resources to create the organization, to create um, rules, to govern interactions between between members of gangs. They have extensive procedures for collecting paperwork. They have written rules that they distribute to prisoners. So it takes a lot of time and energy and resources to create gangs. And it's only worth doing that if you can't rely on other lower cost methods of governing interactions with other prisoners. And so my argument essentially is that when prison populations were small, prisoners could rely on very decentralized, informal mechanisms. Um, prior to the 1960s, um, social norms governed interactions between prisoners. There was a sort of understanding that um, good prisoners, good convicts, would not inform on other prisoners. They wouldn't steal from other people. They wouldn't lie or cheat. They'd pay back their debts. And to the extent that prisoners abided by this code, something that they often called the prisoner's code or the convict code, the more one adhered to it, um, the higher status that person would be. And being in good standing meant that a person would have the support of his peers. He'd be less likely to be victimized. In order for that informal system of norms to work well, you have to know people's social standing. You have to be able to know enough about someone and their reputation that you know where in the pecking order they stand. Now, if a prisoner violated those norms frequently, his standing would fall and people wouldn't want to associate with them and they might you know, be more likely to victimize that person. So in small prison populations, it's your prisoners are able to know each other's reputations and that reputation then becomes something that you can use to encourage compliance with acceptable social norms. So if prisoners violated these codes, uh, they'd be subject to gossip and ostracism and shaming from other prisoners. And in some sense, those are sort of ideal mechanisms of social control because they're very cheap to produce. They don't require the investment to create an organization, and they don't require a lot of coordination of collective action. So in the period when those informal norms work very well, there's no reason for them to incur the cost to create gangs. And that's my argument for why gangs are dominant today in large populations of strangers but we don't observe those in smaller prison populations. Yeah, we well, mentioned that the, the convict code, if you like, was was informal. So, would you see gangs as providing more more formal governance? Is that yeah. So today, um, we prisoners can't just sort of rely in an ad hoc fashion on norms to emerge. Uh, the gangs themselves write written rules. In many prisons, they distribute written rules to new prisoners that tell them what's acceptable behavior there. Some of these are, are very um, um, sort of usual or ordinary. You know, for example, don't throw trash on the prison tier unless it's being swept. So there's a concern about reducing sort of negative effects on other prisoners. Um, some of them are more oriented to gang life, and some prisons. Prisoners have to work out for a minimum of one hour a day so that they can contribute to the sort of um, physical intimidation uh, necessary for a gang uh, to maintain uh, its place in the prison hierarchy. And then sometimes these written rules include um, uh, sort of direct um, um, rules related to the illicit economy. So sometimes gangs will, in these rules, tell prisoners how much of an illegal drug deal they have to pay as a so-called tax to uh, the gang leaders. So the gang spent a lot more time explicitly writing rules, distributing them to new prisoners, and many gangs require new prisoners to sort of pass a test, often to be able to recite what the rules are before they can interact with them out in the prison yard. So would it be fair, would it be a fair way, is it too much a stretch to, to think of this almost like a prison constitution? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think it's not much of a stretch. Um, so gangs write rules that tell their members how to interact with members of other gangs. But the gangs also write more foundational or constitutional style rules um, that define on what terms prisoners will affiliate within a gang. And so I argue that gangs face a very similar problem that nation states face which is one that um, in the Federalist Papers in America, Madison spoke very eloquently about. He said that we need to find ways to empower uh, a state that can enforce our rights without 
allowing it to use that power to violate our rights. And the gangs face the same problem. They want to um, create a gang that can enforce the rights of prisoners, but control the power so that the gang doesn't prey on its own prisoners again. And so when you observe the internal written constitutions of these gangs, they often include, you know, fairly elaborate relative to sort of our, our priors, fairly elaborate systems of checks and balances, elections of leaders, impeachment procedures. There are built into these uh, gang organizations methods of holding members who have been given power uh, accountable for how they use that power. Yeah. You may just have been the first person to compare Madison to a, a prison gang shot caller, <laughs> uh, which is uh, a good thing, I think. Um, so, I mean, that's, that makes lots of sense to me, for sure. I mean, one thing, when you, when you read the book, one thing that's quite striking, there's lots of quite vivid descriptions of violence that um, occurs in prison. I mean, how do you reconcile that evidence with, with what you, how you describe the way that prison gangs keep some sort of order? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think that there's a, a few ways that I think about it. Um, the first is that um, gangs have a positive effect on other prisoners in a few important ways. They make um, prisoners... Um, in these large populations a bit safer, and they facilitate access to um, the illicit economy. And if it weren't for gangs, I don't think either of those things would be nearly as true. Now, of course, from a prison warden's perspective, more flourishing illicit trade is a bad thing. Um, but there's also sort of broader criteria that we, I think, should very reasonably think about when assessing the role of gangs in the society. So prison gangs have few... Um, mechanisms of accountability outside of itself. So if a member of a prison gang isn't happy with the constitution that they have, there's very few options for them to turn to other institutions to sort of check that power. Gangs have very little interest in equity across prisoners. They sort of intentionally seek out prisoners who they think are undesirable, such as sex offenders, um, and, and sometimes just automatically assault those individuals. And in a sense, you know, we're giving power to people in prisons or gangs give power to people in prison who are most willing to use that power to try to dominate others in their community. And so when we sort of think about a broad array of characteristics for what sorts of institutions are working well or not, gangs sort of check a few boxes, but they sort of leave out a few other ones. Um, there is sort of an interesting pattern that we observe both in California, but also in other Latin American cases, which is that prison gangs don't use violence. Prison gangs' goal isn't to use violence against people. They use violence as a mean to accomplish the end of gaining control of a community. So you typically see a lot of prison gang violence when there's no there's no stability or equilibrium in the communities that are there. So when they're fighting for battle, when they're fighting for control, we see a lot of gang violence. But when that sort of battle has, has come to an end, when it's stabilized, violence drops dramatically. And so one of the alternative explanations for the role of gangs in California is that gangs form to promote violence. That's something that prison officials often say. They have an agenda of violence. Um, the problem is that that's inconsistent with the evidence over the last 70 years. Prisons have become significantly less violent since the 1970s at the same time that prison gangs have emerged and become incredibly prominent. So if your argument is that gangs exist because they want to promote violence, uh, by the data itself, it looks like they've failed to do that. And that makes me think that that's not the best explanation uh, for explaining the historical variation in gangs. Yeah. I imagine one question that, that comes to many people's <clears throat> minds when they think about prison gangs and hear the descriptions that, that you provide is what would happen if they went to prison? So would they have to join a prison gang? And if they didn't do, what would be the consequences? So in California, everyone has to affiliate with some, some group, some group that's going to hold their members accountable for their interactions with others. Now, the gangs are the most dominant groups there. And um, most prisoners will go and they will affiliate with the racial and gang group at the prison uh, in which they, which they live. Um, but when they leave prison, they don't have to continue working for the gang. So it's sort of a just-in-prison sort of affiliation. And absolutely, all prisoners have to affiliate with some group. In addition to the gangs, there are sometimes other periphery groups that 
will provide this mutual accountability or, or mutual responsibility that the gangs provide. So, for example, I, I sort of discovered a bit more when I was done with the book that religious groups in prisons often play the same role. So as long as you're a member of the evangelicals group, that group is responsible for your actions. And as long as they hold you responsible for it, then you can sort of um, spend less, be less involved with the sort of gang elements. So in that way, the, the religious groups are providing similar governance functions as the gangs, although presumably less of the criminal and violence functions um, that the prison gangs are often involved with. So it'd be fair to say you, you cannot be a solitary individual I and mean, you cannot be a holdout, so to speak. Yeah, I think there are, are, are very few sort of lone wolves um, because when these individuals are there, if they're not affiliated with the group, first of all, um, gangs will pressure other gangs to be held to, to bring the new prisoner in. So prisoners will say, look, you've got a new guy in the yard. You need to teach him the rules. You need to show him he can hang with you guys, but he can't hang with us. And so there's a there's a pressure to incorporate people into this sort of social order. And secondly, even if, if that sort of failed to happen, um, a lone individual uh, would be a sort of very prime target for prisoners who might wish to steal from him or victimize him in, in some ways. Yeah. I mean, this may be a stretch too far. So, but, but, so could we then imagine that the, the prisons are close to what we might think of the state of nature in social science? Is this something that's sort of... I think that um, I think of the counterfactual of a sort of Hobbesian anarchy is the context in which these prisoners operate, and that there are vast uh, scopes of interactions that are outside of the reach of the state. And in that sense, they are in a state of nature. And so really, I think of this uh, story, uh, this book, as a sort of historical analogy to the emergence of states. So I do think that one effective way to think of gangs is as a type of nation state and their interactions within the prison yard are very much akin to the international anarchy of uh, the global system of nations. Okay. I mean, this brings us really to your sort of latest work in this area, which I believe you're, you're writing a book at the moment on nearing completion of a, of a new book, which I think is going to be called The Puzzle of Prison Order. And maybe just as an introduction to this, to this uh, part of the, the discussion, Maybe you could describe what that book involves and how it extends the, the previous work. Yeah. So my first book was about the history of California over time. And it seemed to answer sort of the role of prisoner demographics and prisoner size for the emergence of gangs. When you look around the world, there are a lot of prisons that don't have gangs. And I wondered to what extent can this theory help explain those things. There are also lots of places that have gangs, but actually relatively small prison populations. So how do we sort of square or understand the relationship between sort of the, the incredible diversity of prison uh, social orders around the world? So it, it's in some ways a more ambitious project, which is trying to say, if you look around the world, life in prison looks incredibly different depending on where you are. Is there a way to sort of build on this theory to help explain more of that variation? I guess the, the question then is, is what's the answer? So yeah. <laughs> why, why does prison social order vary, vary as much as we see? Yeah. So in my new, my new book, I, I make two arguments. Um, the first is that when the quality of governance provided by officials is very low, then there is a strong incentive for prisoners to invest time, energy, and resources to provide governance, to fill in the gap of governance left by ineffective officials. And so in the book, I look at cases of Brazil and Bolivia, where there are incredibly few prisoners, uh, excuse me, incredibly few staff members in prisons. They provide very few resources, sometimes practically no food or clean water. Um, prisons are very dangerous, often in disrepair. And so prisoners are sort of thrown into prison, but provided none of the governance that officials in California, for example, would provide. And so I argue that they respond in a variety of ways to account for that uh, sort of deprivation of governance. So when officials don't govern, prisoners do. And then I look at other extreme examples where officials govern incredibly well. And so for that, I examine Nordic prison systems, where there are a large number of well-trained uh, prison staff, where there are extensive resources. And as a result, I argue, we see very little of the prisoner-produced governance institutions 
that in the extreme we see in Latin America or in the sort of middle range case that we see in California. So that's a, a sort of a major part of it. And then we could talk, if you want, about um, extending the sort of the importance of prison size and looking at places in um, England, for example, and, and women's prisons. Well, I guess given that we're, we're based in London here at King's, maybe you could <coughs> say a little bit about the English prisons. And one sense is that they, they don't have this sort of gang organization that we see in California, probably other countries. So why should that be the case? Yeah, I mean, so my argument is that it, that, that should be puzzling. So um, there are obviously significant differences between the United States, California, and England. Um, but the key features that describe prisons, uh, regardless of where we look, are pretty much the same. They're places where we take people who have been charged with or convicted of a crime and we force them uh, to be confined there. They're typically forced to interact with other people in the same situation. Um, they tend to come from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, they don't have an exit option. You know, you are forced to interact with people. And so when we think as social scientists about what are some of the most important um, characteristics that define and describe social interactions, those are some of the most important ones. And either by definition or practice, that is a good description of prisons, regardless of where we look. And so that w might make you think, well, we should see the same outcomes there. Um, Likewise, or moreover, in England, um, there are many of the same um, legal traditions and institutions as in California and in the United States. Many of the prison practices and criminal justice practices developed in the United States have been adopted through a process of policy transfer in England and in English prisons. And as you note, rightfully, there's no similar or equivalent organization in English prisons as the prison gangs in California. And so th that's the sort of question, is with all these similarities, why don't gangs have such an important influence in English prisons? And my argument essentially comes down to three main factors, three key things that make English prisons substantially different from California prisons. The first is the size of the prison population. Um, and the size of prisons in particular. So the average size prison in California is more than 3,500 prisoners. And in England and Wales, the average size facility is about 600 to 700 prisoners. And so I argue that in those small prisons, like in California prior to the 1960s, in small English prisons, it's a lot easier and more effective to rely on decentralized mechanisms like gossip, shaming, and ostracism. The second key difference is that there's an intentional process of placing prisoners in prisons that are sited close to their home communities in this country. And the intuition is that if you're close to where you come from, your family and other people can visit you, you can maintain healthy, positive relationships. Well, one consequence of that is that when you go to prison, um, you'll show up there and you'll meet and reconnect with people that you knew when you were out in the community. So when you get to prison, there are people there who you already know, and they will already know you. And you'll both know that when you both return to your community out, outside of prison, that you'll know what happened when you were in prison. And so both of these, all of these factors make it a very important that you maintain your reputation. And so it increases the ability to wield these sort of reputation mechanisms to facilitate social control. And with these things being so effective, um, I argue that there's no need to invest in the sort of high structure of uh, what the gangs provide in California. What seems such, such a great challenge that this book takes on is trying to unpack all these different factors, all, all these different possibilities. So I guess one, if you like, common sense sort of question would be, Another difference between California and America and the UK, I guess, is the presence of gangs on the streets. One might assume intuitively that the, the gangs on the streets are more well organised in California compared to, to England and, and, the, and, and Wales, if you like. Is that the case, and how does that then play into the, to the, what happens inside prisons? Yeah, and, and that's a, a common explanation, uh, especially in the criminology literature, that prison gangs exist in prisons because there are street gangs out in the community. And when their members become incarcerated... They import the organization and their culture and organizational structure into the prison uh, system. In the United States case, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. Many of the states where prison gangs emerged earliest um, didn't have a significant street gang presence. 
And if there's no street gang presence, then there's nobody to import the street gangs into the prisons and recreate them there. In the California case, we know that there were street gangs for at least 50 years before we had prison gangs. And so it's unclear why it would take so long for these prison gangs to emerge. And then we can drill down even closer into the historical record in California. And it turns out that many of the first prison gangs formed gangs because they were perceived to be more vulnerable because they weren't sort of sophisticated street criminals by their by their other peers. They weren't judged to be sort of sophisticated. They were seen to be sort of more rural um, and less sophisticated prisoners. So it doesn't seem to line up very well. If you look at... Um, English prisons, um, there are people who are affiliated with street gangs on the outside who, who are incarcerated, of course. And, you know, according to, you know, the, the sort of best ethnographic research that I'm aware of on English street gangs, there are hundreds of street gangs in London. And there are, you know, hundreds of street gang members who could, if they wanted to, go into English prisons and, and reproduce those organizations there. Uh, but we don't see that happening. And I think that the reason we don't see that happening is, again, because it's costly to do that. In fact, you know, some of the research being done shows that it's actually more likely that when you go to prison, you will desist from street gang activity rather than enhance your gang affiliation activity. Yeah. I guess another dimension which I think will, might, may be of interest to people is the difference between men's and women's prisons. So I believe in the book you write a bit about women's prisons. And, and how they differ. Again, maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to, to follow up on the street gang activity, you know, anywhere from, you know, the best estimates suggest between a, a quarter and maybe 40% of gang street gang members are female. So there are a large number of female street gang members. And there is a significant number of all female street gangs. In, and in California in particular, this is especially true. But when you look at the social order in women's prisons in California, again, there are no prison gangs. And so it doesn't seem like the presence of street gangs is enough to get prison gangs in those facilities. Um, the social order that exists in women's prisons in California has actually been remarkably stable um, from the 1950s until the present. So more than 60 years the best studies of women's prisons have a remarkable consistency in how they organize themselves. And um, I guess it's probably characterized in a few ways, is that um, they have a similar system to what men had before, a sort of convict code system. The individual reputation of a, of a woman and her interactions in prison is what matters the most. Um, to the extent that there's social sanctions or punishments, that's sort of chosen uh, by each woman on her own, whether to conform to the norms or not, and whether to violate or punish violations of the norms. In between, you know, zero and 70% of the women studied based on the prison, many women form fictive kinships. They often call them uh, play families or just family. And that's essentially women deciding to take on the roles of the sort of nuclear family. One will be the mom. The other will be the father. They'll adopt kids. They'll have sisters and uncles that create aunt and uncle relationships. And, you know, these are structured in some way. They're organizations in some ways, but they're very different from prison gangs. Uh, membership in these families isn't permanent. You can get divorced and remarried. You can disavow children when you leave prison and return to prison. So these, these things are not permanent and they're much more fluid. And a large number of women don't participate in fictive kinships. Another interesting feature of women's prisons is that they're not as racially and ethnically segregated as California men's prisons are. Now, we don't have any particular reason to explain that difference, um, except I argue that women's prisons don't have racial segregation in the same way because they still have relatively small prison populations. So remember that men solidify racial and ethnic distinctions when they have to rely on community responsibility systems among strangers. Because women's prison populations are very small, they can still rely on reputation mechanisms, and so they don't need to use race as a sort of indicator of some broader affiliation. So women's prisons look, in these sort of abstract terms, a lot more like men's prisons look when they had very small prison populations. And in fact, 
the size of women's prisons in California have never reached the height of men's prisons when men were forced to turn uh, to gangs. Yeah. Well, let me now ask a sort of mischievous question, which is I know you've looked at prisons all around the world and, and spent many, many years, if like, reading lots of research. Is there a, a country in a prison system that is completely the opposite to what your theory would predict? Is the one where it's inverse? We see if like a small prison population and we see lots of gangs running the prison. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that the, the best cases that specifically are challenge that argument, there's other things that are also moving. Other variables are changing. So, you know, I mentioned there are Brazilian prisons where um, they're fairly small populations, but officials provide no governance. So to the extent that gangs are governing, the scope of interactions in which prisoners must govern in Brazil is significantly larger than it is in California. So because they have no access to official governance, um, you know, they really have to um, invest even if they can know each other's reputations. There's also, you know, sort of prisons that I've not studied that I think are very important that I just simply haven't had time to sort of work on and think about. So, for example, um, the Soviet gulags are a very interesting and very distinct um, set of prisons. They're incredibly poor, like the Latin American prisons, but instead of being neglected um, by officials, they're domin- you know, they're, there's a dominant control by officials to control prisoners, and they're sent out to work you know, brutally long hours and then returned. And so there's not a flourishing of extra-legal governance in gulags because the resources are taken away, but then they're controlled and forced out to do other work. So there's no opportunity, there's no freedom for them to respond to that scarcity by governing themselves. And so I, I think that you know, there's a lot that I don't know, uh, a lot of open questions about sort of how to think about things like the gulags or concentration camps, places of, of ultimate dominance by officials. So it's a story ultimately about governance, much less about the size of prisons. It's about the presence or absence of formal governance. That, that's it's the presence or absence, and then if they're present, are they providing helpful things, or are they just controlling sort of every single moment, every crumb of food, every breath of air? Um, so are they present, and if they are, what are they doing? Yeah. I guess it's one thing that, again, one thing, many, many fascinating things here, but one thing that's striking is, as you said earlier, prisoners are people, if you like, with, with very low resources, that they may be people with predisposed to, to violence, with, with histories of, um, of violence and, um, what's the word, um, things have been done to them. Victimisation is what I'm looking mm-hmm. for, I guess. So should this lead us to be hopeful about people's capacity for self-governance, if, if you like, even these people are capable of organising themselves to, to, to govern themselves? Yeah, you know, that's one of the reasons I was initially interested in, in this research topic is to understand, sort of to look at a, at a community in which we might think it's least likely that cooperation would emerge. So in the academic literature, there are some fascinating studies of um, sort of elite and rich commercial uh, enterprises that they're able to engage in self-governance over commerce. Um, they can't. They don't rely on the state, um, and that's sort of an interesting finding. But you wonder how much is it that these come from very privileged backgrounds that they're able to maintain or, or this level of cooperation. And so, by by turning yeah to the prison, we tend to think that on average prisoners tend to have less self-control. They have less. Um, they, they have, they have, they're more impatient. They're less willing to wait for future mm-hmm. benefits. Um, they're more often perpetrators and victims of violence. So for all these things, you would think that cooperation would be far more difficult there. And so what I think, you know, sort of this research that I'm doing finds is that in small prison populations, those are not sufficient to undermine cooperation. The ability to rely on reputation, even if there's a sort of bias in the agent type, uh, cooperation can still emerge and work pretty well. I think that in large prison populations, as those reputation mechanisms become less effective, um, then it becomes less stable. And this investment in sort of centralized um, mutual responsibility systems, it actually looks a lot like clan-based societies. So if you look historically, clan-based societies are incredibly common. If you look in many places in the world today, clans are a defining um, feature of social life and economic life. And where are clans 
most common. They're common in places that have failed or weak states and that are of sufficient size that you couldn't rely on these sort of decentralized mechanisms. So I think that gangs are the sort of clans of the prison society. And so to some extent, this biased agent type is successful because it's able to cooperate despite sort of the inherent difficulties on average uh, of the characteristics of the members, but it's not sufficient to sort of overcome large populations of strangers and lack of state support. Yeah. So it's undoubtedly impressive that prisoners are able to, to self-organize, if, if you like, self-govern in this way. We're I mean, thinking of the comparative political economy of this, though. Would it be better if there was formal governance? In some sense, is that safer, less violent, all those things? Yeah, I think that the... I think that um, if we were designing an ideal prison social system, nobody thinks that it should be the gangs that control the everyday life of prisoners. Um, the, so it's sort of like, given the poor official governance and given the size of the population on the margin, you know, I think that gangs play an important and on the margin, probably a productive role. Um, but no, yeah, I mean, I think the solution to gangs is more and better state-produced governance. So I argue that people turn to gangs because they feel vulnerable in a dangerous environment. I argue that um, prisoners um, turn to gangs because they want access to resources that they, they can't get from officials. So if you want to reduce the demand for prisoners to turn to gangs, it would seem that the answer is make prisons safer, arguably by a better trained staff and smaller prison populations, and to increase access that they have to resources. Um, so, yeah, I think that the appropriate um, lesson is to, to think that if you want to reduce the control of gangs, you need to improve the effectiveness of the state-based governance. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, it's a great, it's a very interesting conclusion. Maybe for some people, it might be a slightly challenging, challenging conclusion. For others, it, it, it may be less so, I suppose. Um, I wanted to move on a little bit to talk about the, the basis of the research on which you, you, you base your conclusions. Um, essentially, you're, you're engaging in qualitative research. Um, maybe the, the first question there is to say a little bit about the challenges of obtaining that kind of data from, from prisons around the world and how you go about overcoming that, that challenge. Yeah, well, maybe if I can start with the sort of first project. Um, the goal was essentially, there, so there's not, there's not uh, never available to me sort of the quantitative data that in my mind I sort of might most hope to have. And so I started to try to collect evidence in as many different ways as I could. So um, I'd go and collect um, legal documents, like law enforcement documents and indictments that are describing in case after case, you know, how these gangs are operating. I'd also visit prisons in California and talk to correctional officers. I would meet with the gang investigations unit, which is the sort of police for gangs in prisons. Um, I talked to prisoners, some sometimes behind uh, bars, but often formerly incarcerated people after release to try to understand their experiences. So the goal, you know, uh, in addition to the secondary literature, of course, the, and so the goal was to sort of triangulate across these resources to understand how governance uh, or, or to understand what gangs are doing today and what they did previously. Historically, I collected data on the demographics of the prison population, which allowed me to track the sort of rise of the population and the rise of gangs. And the Department of Corrections also has a number of reports that were produced in the 50s and 60s and 70s where they were writing about the problems prisoners faced. You know, and so the, the, the officials knew that prisoners were a lot more vulnerable, that things were more chaotic. They recognized these same problems. And so really the, the goal was to sort of bring a sort of new institutional economics theory uh, to bear, uh, to test, and to triangulate across these different evidentiary sources uh, to see if that was a plausible story. And so I sort of argue in the book that that seems pretty persuasive. This new project is, is in some ways just an entirely different um, methodological approach. So uh, the vast majority, you know, I'm sure 99% or more of prison ethnographies focus on a single prison some uh, within a single country, but usually it's a single prison. And ethnography is an incredibly time and resource intense method. It requires you know, countless hours observing prisons, talking to prisoners, talking to staff. And that's necessary in order to get the sort of fine-grained 
you know, thick, rich, descriptive understanding of the community that's in operation there. Um, but for the most part, these studies produce a book or a few articles in a book, and the sort of the questions stop there. And so my argument in this book essentially is that we can use these individual single site studies, ethnographies, as, as data, as data in a broader comparative analysis. And so my, my goal for this book is to sort of make an argument that prison ethnography and maybe prison sociology more generally should take a comparative turn. Just as in political science, comparative politics has been sort of, um, you know, a very sophisticated field methodologically for many decades, I think we can take a lot of the learning that was done in political science and use it to inform how to make comparisons and how to compare across, in some ways, different uh, cases to understand or draw broader theories or understandings about governance. What are your, what's your sense of the, the challenges of comparing different ethnographic studies Guess studies with diachronic and geographical variation. I think that it must be done carefully, and I think that's true in comparative politics too. Um, so prisons, as I've sort of argued, they do share core similarities, which means we should compare them, but there's a lot of things that are different across them. So some ethnographies are just simply irrelevant to maybe a particular question that I want to ask. So, for example, there's a pretty extensive literature on sort of family relationships for people who are incarcerated. There's a lot of uh, on, on sort of work in prison and food in prison. And these are interesting and important studies, but they're sort of not directly relevant to the work um, that I'm trying, the questions that I'm trying to ask. So, so I think the, the goal is to read extensively enough that you can weed out ones that aren't relevant. And then to se start selecting the cases that you study based on some developed theory. So we say that you should select cases based on variation in the explanatory variables, which basically means that if you think that the size of the prison population matters, then you should try to find prisons that are small and prisons that are large. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that they're similar on other factors as well, differences in social order can then be explained by differences in explanatory factors like size. Yeah. I'll come on to, to explanation in a second, in a way. I, I, just, I was curious to also ask, as you've spoken to people who also work in prison, on prisons, who maybe undertake ethnographic research, I mean, have you had pushback from people who think that you shouldn't take other people's research and, and reuse it, if you like, in this way? Uh, nobody, actually, no. Um, no I, I haven't come across someone like that. I mean, part of my argument is that um, the work that single-site ethnographers are doing is um, even more valuable than we sort of understand it already to be. Because their work, it, it doesn't just explain the case that they looked at. It helps us explain many other cases. And so I actually see it as, a, as almost an inspiring opportunity to do a sort of a decentralized but collaborative research program where you can continue to study single sites but be in conversation informally or just you know to a lesser extent with prison ethnographers working all around the world. And to me, that's where we can really accumulate enough studies and enough tests, additional tests, that I think we can really uh, make some advance in sort of learning you know, across many different cases. So how does comparative ethnography limit, if you like, or extend the kind of questions we, we can answer? Um, so I think that it expands our ability to understand... Um, so, so, so ethnography gives us the deep description of the everyday life of prisoners. And for someone interested in governance, like I am, we need that ethnographic evidence. Mm -hmm. And so having more ethnographies allows us to, I hope, develop um, a more sophisticated and complete understanding of governance than the sort of initial blocks that I've put together. Mm -hmm. So if we had five times as, matter, matter, uh, as many ethnographies, I think that we'd be able to tell a lot more how important, for example, size versus location is. Or I make an argument in my first book that the diversity of the prison population matters. In doing qualitative case studies or ethnographies, we can often say that we think, say, size and diversity and location matter, but we can't always say how much it matters. So if we had a lot more cases, we'd be able to disentangle sort of what is the relationship across all of our different explanatory variables. So, for example, we could have prisons that were small and very homogenous, prisons that were small and very diverse, 
prisons that were large and very homogenous and so on. And we'd have the permutations that we'd be able to tease out a lot more um, about what, what those relationships actually are. So you were trained as an economist originally. How would economists view this sort of methodological approach? And would they be concerned about your ability to really give causal answers? Yeah, I think that's a, a, fair, uh, a fair observation. And I think that the sort of standard approach in economics is now focused on causal identification. So statistical tools that allow us to identify how X affects or causes Y. And I think that that's an incomplete method for understanding prison social order for, for a few different reasons. The first is that the data is simply not available. Um, it's often not, av- not kept and usually uh, confidential. So there's no data available. And in many cases, it's difficult to find an identification strategy. Um, So it can only tell us so much. Even if it could tell us something about sort of abstract uh, causal relationships, what I think is really important about this research and about the broader sort of uh, intellectual community that I'm engaged with is that it tells us a lot about causal mechanisms. So we may know that as X changes, Y changes, as the prison population goes up, the gangs emerge, but we don't know necessarily why that's the case. So this qualitative work allows us to identify the causal mechanism that explains the why behind a causal effect. So I think it really provides a a radically different type of understanding based on a very different type of evidence, something that I think traditional economic tools and data are, in most cases, not able to speak to. As a political scientist, when we see political science going in a similar direction to economics in the past, we've, I guess, an emphasis emphasis on causal identification on experimental results and so on. I mean, should we be concerned about that? I mean, is it limiting the types of questions that political science can can ask? I, I think it is a concern. I My sense is that there's starting to be some pushback. So uh, strict adherence to causal uh, identification, causal effects, uh, limits our ability to ask a large number of important questions, sometimes the big questions. But it certainly, even in smaller, more man- manageable questions, limits what you can say. And my sense is that there's a push for causal effects requiring some some legitimate evidence about what the causal mechanism actually is. And you see that in the sort of the top journals in political science that there's a, there may be a nice causal effect, but if it doesn't have the causal mechanism, then it's going to be much less likely to be persuasive. So, you know, when, when we have causal effects, it tells us what happened, but not why it happened. And I think the qualitative evidence, uh, whether it's ethnography or interviews uh, or observation, allow us to know not just what, but why it happened. And I think there's also going to be a return to theory. Uh, so I think that theory and ethnographic and qualitative work is going to allow us to interpret sort of broad relationships between X and Y. When you say theory there, what sort of theory do you mean? Maybe? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I mean formal theory often. I think that the, the, the careful modeling of relationships uh, whether that's game theory or, or something else, but you know, pr- pr- primarily I have game theory in mind, yeah. I think is one way to get at what actually is going on in some broader relationship. And I actually think that there's a lot of complementarity between using qualitative evidence to test whether a particular theory is actually describing the process that's going on rather than just explaining the sort of start and finish uh, of yeah. some causal effect. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Well, you've done this great work on, on prisons, and I know you've been working on this for a number of years. I'm curious to know what's next on the agenda. So I assume you're not going to work on prisons forever, though I may be wrong. Um, what other sorts of ideas do you have going forward? Um, I'm, I'm sort of starting two new research projects. Um, one is with an economist at Syracuse named Roger Koppel, and we're doing some work on the institutional setting in which criminal forensic science takes place. And it turns out that forensic science is uh, much less scientific than depicted in, in, in TV shows and movies. But the institutions, the political institutions in which they operate, uh, are also um, very imperfect, very deeply flawed. And we, we essentially are going to argue that the institutions in which forensic science takes place uh, lack accountability, uh, independence, and replicability. And those are three crucial ingredients for science to weed out errors and learn its craft better. Um, In addition to that, I'm also doing um, some research on mid-19th century American frontier violence. 
So um, this was a time period when many states, uh, well, well, areas were not states yet in the sort of western frontier in America. And so my interest is understanding um, causes of violence across regions in this period and when individuals turn to what are called vigilance committees, uh, sort of extra legal justice in order to respond to uh, violence, statelessness, and inequality. Well, those sound like great topics. Um, we look forward to, to reading about them as you as you write about them. And we look forward to the publication of your, your new book. I think it's due out next summer, I believe, summer 2020, um, The Puzzle of Prison Order, I think it's correct. And we hope you'll come back and talk to us again in the future. I'd love to. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.